Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Storytale Stagings inside of the Home Staging TV YouTube channel. I'm your host, Tori Toth. I am super excited to have um, this guest with me today. Uh, she is one of the top 100 elite uh, women who are, sh who's, who, I'm sorry, are sharing the real estate, who shares the in real estate industry, and she's also the author of Home Staging for Dummies. Uh, Christine Ray has influenced the staging industry from the beginning of her career uh, through the innovative development of a business training and certification program called CSP International Staging Business Training Academy. Her unique signature CSP real estate staging business training and certification program has received multiple awards, um, accolades, recognition, and accreditation. And she is extremely proud to be the first recipient of the RISA Lifetime Achievement Award for her contribution to the industry. So I wanna welcome Christine to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want, I want to hear it all, Christine, right? Because you've been in business. How long have you been in the industry? 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. Yes. And I'm sure it's, you know, I'm sure it's changed a lot. So what did the home staging industry look like when you started? And actually, why did you start in this industry? Hmm. I started because I had lost my job in the corporate world. I had worked there for 25 years for a franchise owner and worked it as if it was my business. And when I lost my job, I was the last person to know. So it was like, I took a few months off and thought I was gonna start a decorating business. That was where, you know, your passion is sort of thing and you think you have a skill to do it. Um, my husband was concerned that people would actually pay me to do something like that, move stuff around in somebody else's house, as he called it. And um, and so that really was how I got started. And I went to a networking meeting. I was talking to a real estate agent and I'm sort of good at thinking on my feet. And, you know, I really hadn't flushed out anything that I was doing. I hadn't really started my business, but I just talked as if I had. And I talked about real estate staging and he said, what is that? And I said, oh, you know, it's like, it's like model homes only for people who live in their houses and are selling them. And he goes, Oh my God, that's an amazing service. Would you come and talk at my office? And I'm like, sure. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my diary, which was like, you know, yoga, tennis. <laughs> and I said, it's going to take me about three weeks before I can fit you in. Um, which I thought to myself, how can I find out about this business if there is one? And to make a presentation, to, to be able to stand up and be legitimate. And so that really started my search and finding it and, you know, finding out what was there. And really, you know, to answer your first question was, what was it like? I mean, it was really a lot of real estate agents talking to sellers about painting the front door, putting the baby pictures away and cutting the grass. Very, very, very basic foundational stuff. You know, we've come a long, long way. Yeah. So, I mean, what are some of the ways that you've seen the, the industry change over the years? Like, what are some things that have stood out to you? I, I think the biggest change is that there's a definite shift towards vacant staging being the predominant part of our industry. When people think they're going to do staging and it's like, oh, I want to have a business, their biggest concerns are, how am I going to get furniture? What if I can only afford a couple of houses of furniture? And they still don't have any concept of how much a house of furniture will cost them. So, you know, rental furniture houses have grown, you know, to the industry. When I first started, there was one in the whole of Canada uh, and one in the U.S., or maybe two in the U.S. But now there's, you know, a plethora of them providing yeah. that service to people who are renting furniture to put into vacant properties. Um, yeah, and I think now there's even, you know, a variety of different services that home stagers provide. I see a couple people on here. So thank you so much for joining us. If you guys have any questions for Christine, right, please go ahead, put them in the comments below and we will answer those as I go through some of my burning questions for her. <laughs> um, 
So I know people always ask, uh, is a staging certification really necessary? And so what would you say to someone who's kind of on the fence about that? <laughs> well, it's my favorite um, answer is yes, of course, it's, it's important. And I think there's a misnomer about it. Generally, what they're saying is you can start a business in this industry without any training, and you can. It's a non-regulated industry, and ostensibly, nobody cares whether you have training or not. The key question to ask yourself is, do you actually know what you're doing? Do you know how to run a business? Do you know how to put a business plan together? Do you know how to price? Do you know how to talk to people? Do you know how to overcome objections? Do you know how to? Do you know how to? Do you know how to? And do you really know how to stage? Or is it only your impression of what you think staging is? And I don't think this is something, yes, it's something that's fun to do, but I don't think it's something that should be taken lightly. I think it's a serious business and it needs to be treated so. Yeah, so what would you, you know, what should people seriously consider before jumping into a staging career? Because a lot of people are like, oh, that sounds like such an awesome career. And it's like, there's a lot involved. <laughs> <laughs> when I worked with Michael E. Gerber, he wrote the E-Myth Revisited, his perfect sort of analogy for people who think they want to have a business is to think of a pie. And if you were to draw that circle and divide it up as a pie without knowing anything, and you think, oh, I want to be a stager, how much of that pie do you think you will be actually staging? Mm -hmm. because staging is simply a job within your business. And if you think it is the major part of what you'll be doing, you need to be a staging assistant for somebody else. Because yeah, I, I running think a lot of, is what takes the time. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't think about that in the beginning, and then they get involved in the, the whole business aspect of it. And it is. It's going out there and selling yourself. It's marketing. It's having, you know, a, a plan for your business to see it grow or what happens if it's, if it's you know, failing. Um, and I know that that's what you cover in, in your academy. So how is your certification program different from others out there? Because I know that you were one of the originals in the beginning, and now there's a, a plethora of different um, companies that provide training like this. So what makes yours so unique? Well, because I take certification seriously, it's not a test, it's an exam, and it's an exam of knowledge and also of skill. You know, having your skills um, assessed by a third party that's credible, that designation says, I can do this. I can actually do this. I'm not just telling you I can do this, but somebody else who's an authority has said I could do this just like you wouldn't work with uh, you know an engineer that didn't have letters after your name and it's more than letters after your name I always think that people who say they don't you don't need training and I I'm not at all saying that there aren't successful people who didn't get training but you have to have the business element and I think that's really what was the motivator for me to get into the business because as I ran my own staging business and went to conferences where, you know, decorators were and new stages were, the single question always was, well, how, how did you become successful? How did you, how do you price? You know, it's always, how do you price? What do you charge? And I realized the gap in the market was you had talented people without a concept of how to run the business side of things. So I focused on the business side of things. All the things that you've mentioned, you know, the business planning and talking to real estate agents, doing presentations, you know, getting the client um, to come along on the journey and to not compromise the standard of work. I always say with home inspectors, we, we accept home inspectors as a logical part of the process of getting property sold. And nobody ever says to a home inspector, mm, let's not go down to the basement. And, and I only want you to look at three rooms on the main floor. And no, I don't, I don't want to pay $500 for, for, you, for your consultation. Nobody says that to them. So why do they say them to stagers? And they say them to stagers because they can and because the majority of the stagers in our industry don't know how to deflect those questions. Mm -hmm. 
And so they compromise the integrity of the work and it compromises the integrity of the industry. And it's a challenge. And I think because, you know, anybody can put a, their name on a business card, you can get a business card for $10 or so Vistaprint, you know, and you think it's going to be easy. You just get, it's like people say, oh, I've got a website. Okay. How do you get people there? It's, it's, you know, they don't know you're here. How are you going to do it? Yeah. And you know, if you're in that part of the business, you know, how to get people to notice you. Um, but I just I think, think the majority of people who get involved in wanting to be a stager um, just do not understand how much business knowledge they need and how much time the business takes. And I think it's also a disservice. I have one client who's actually more of an agent and who decided she wanted to become a stager herself because she wasn't finding good quality stagers in her area. And it was almost putting a bad taste in her mouth. Um, because these people weren't certified, they didn't have the right training. So I think that's another reason why it's so important to make sure that you are getting the proper training before you put yourself out there and start diluting the industry, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, how many, so how many different courses do you offer now? Cause you have so many continuing ed courses and, you know, obviously <laughs> core training. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, when we started, there wasn't an industry. If you think about that, when I started, there wasn't an industry. And then as the industry grew and I saw that there was a gap in the market for the business training is when I started CSP uh, International. And I think it was as early as like 2000 and I almost want to say six, but could have been seven when I realized you need continuing education, just like real estate agents have to go to school and they have to take electives and then, you know, to get their licensing and they have to maintain that business um, that they, they have to maintain their education. Then I thought stages should be required to do the same. So uh, even before RISA started, I was running a continuing ed program and expanded that. I look at how is the industry changing and what skill sets do stages need? If you are pursuing a niche, for instance, like senior move management or um, so Rachel Borelli, she teaches our residential transition specialist uh, training. Um, Deborah Boucher teaches the residential renovation project manager. So that meant, you know, back in 2010, when the financial world collapsed and we had a lot of foreclosures across the U.S. and parts of Canada, um, you know, the revival of the industry came through people who were flipping houses and stages were helping. And I'm like, well, how can you do that? Because <laughs> renovations wasn't staging. And HGTV responded at that time doing the flip uh, program started. And so I looked at the liability of a stager doing that work. And just because it worked out, you were your own general contractor when you did your own bathroom, doesn't mean you can do it forever without mm -hmm. uh, a problem. So I found an expert who could alert you to everything that could possibly go wrong on a project. And here are all the things that you need to do to protect yourself. So it's an awesome course. And um, yeah, she's been teaching it, I think, since 2008. It's really wonderful. And she gives you all kinds of information and um, documents you know, how to put your folder together just in case a site inspector comes in, how to hold back money, just all the variables of that sort of program, you know. So, do you have one course that you're most proud of um, getting out there to the industry? Well, sure. The CSP business program, I think, is, is essential. Um, it's to me, it's our foundation piece, it's what we started for and with. Um, the others are. You know, if you're an established stager and you're now veering off into uh, a niche, then those sort of things will help. And we do fun ones as well. You know, we're doing one this week uh, coming up on the 31st with um, my girlfriend, Linnell Hartman, who's been a stager. She's had a, a luxury staging business. She had a big warehouse. She went into photography. She's now gone into um, sort of refurnishing, refurbishing furniture, which has always really been a passion for her. And so she is doing a workshop on paint it. You can paint fabric. 
and you're going to, she's going to do it live, paint a chair and revitalize it. So if you have inventory, it's a way to extend the life of your inventory, you know, mm -hmm. so we don't just do serious things, but I think, you know, I, for me, the thing that I'm the proudest of in my whole career are the people who come through the Academy halls of fame as you were and go on and have outstanding business success. I mean, I'm just proud to have been part of all of that. You know, the, it's the talent comes to the school and then gives them the foundation to run their business. So yeah, I, gonna... that, I was going to say, there's, I, there's people in the industry who I taught in 2002 who, and it's a requirement to come back to class. So it's, again, it's upgrading your skills all the time, you know? So I think, you know, that's why they win a lot of awards, you know? Sorry, I cut you off there. No, I was going to, I was going to ask you, you know, what has been your secret to kind of keeping your drive and staying passionate about your business? And it sounds like it is your actual success stories and the people that have gone through the program. Yeah. I mean, there's days when just like everybody, you know, you have a wobbly day, um, things might not be going well, or, you know, you had too many gin and tonics the night before or something. You're just thinking, what are you doing? You know, people always say to me, it's like, when are you quitting? And I'm like, really quitting? I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I really haven't thought about it. Um, so I just bless the day when I wake up and I'm still alive. I'm on this side of the fence, as it were, or the grass, and I keep going. But um, I just think there's such a big need for what we do. And I do think our industry is going to see huge growth in the next three to five years, probably sooner rather than later. And I think that if you're not, if your business is not set up to be successful, you'll get swallowed up. There'll be a tsunami of need. And, and I think another thing that's changed, um, Tori, is a, a big change is that when I started, the majority of people who got into the staging industry were over 50. Mm -hmm. And now they're late 20s and early 30s. So are you and finding this to be their first actual career and not necessarily their, their start over, their second? Um, it's not necessarily that, but they are coming into the industry with far more education. And I think COVID certainly turned the tide on that where people were like, okay, I need to be more in control of something. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see people who are, you know, just young moms saying, okay, I'm carving out something that I can build longevity with and for. I see people starting their businesses with their partners in life, you know, and they're looking at it to expand it, to, to include their kids as that grows. So I think um, it, that approach is going to be stronger for us in the long run. You know, but that recent uh, industry report that came out from RISA, and, and it showed like the majority of people uh, are not really set up. For the, well, I, was, I think it was 60%, more than 60% were under two years in the business, which yeah. tells me there's a lot of turnover in the business. And there's a lot of people who get disappointed. They have dreams. It's just like for me, when you drive through town and you see a restaurant closed and a flower shop closed, and I just think there's somebody's dream that's gone nowhere. And you wouldn't open a restaurant because you like to cook without having all the ducks in a row. You have to have a plan to get people to come to the restaurant. You'll have to have food. How are you going to get your you know, your message out there, you have to do all of the business side of things in order to run a successful restaurant. And I think it's the same with our industry. You know, at any given time, there's a third of real estate agents getting out of the business because they can't make it work. Um, and some of it could be that, you know, they've decided to, it's not for them or they are retiring, but a lot of them get in thinking it's easy money and they don't realize it's also hard work. Yeah. You know, for real estate agents, it's, you know, the fortunate part, I think, of being a stager is that you know where your target is. For a real estate agent, they're like, out there, somebody's trying to sell a house and I want them to pick me, right? But the problem is our real estate stagers do not understand how to approach a real estate agent properly, right? So then they get disappointed, 
Like yeah. Do, do you find that is, so I was going to ask you, what is the common cause you feel for home staging businesses to fail? So do you think that that's one of them? And do you have any tips to prevent this from happening? Well, I think they fail to plan. And if you fail to plan, you plan to fail and they don't price for profit and they really don't know what they're doing. You know, it's just, that's really, I would say that actually, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. And I start out a program with that. It's like, you don't know what you don't know, but at the end of this course, you will know what you don't know. And you will know what parts you actually need to strengthen. Right. So it's like, for me, when I was in the field, anything I did, whether it was a phone call, a presentation, a proposal, a job, always what went well, what could have gone better, how am I going to make sure that happens? So, and I still do that today, even on, on a regular day, I'm in the office. It's like, sometimes you feel like you didn't get anywhere with that. I'm a big <laughs> list maker. So I like chip, chip, take off all the things that I got done. And sometimes, you know, my day gets started and I didn't get time to make the list. So I will take a minute and stop. And I'll write down all the things I've already done and then check them all off. And I'm like, okay, look, good. And now what else is left, right? It's planning. It's planning is crucial. And when, when you look at, you know, how many, how many hours do you have to sell? There's not many. If you are only working at part time, there's even less, but if you're doing mm -hmm. a full-time job, you know, and this is another reason why people fail is because they burn out. Well, why do they burn out? Because they do more than a 40 hour week. They work 40 hours in their staging business and then they come home and do the business managing part and they start losing their life. You know, oh, I have four proposals to do. I can't go to the family barbecue or I can't go to, you know, we can't go anywhere now with COVID. I know a bunch of people. <laughs> generally it's like, oh no, I can't go to lunch with my girlfriends because I've got a stage or I've got a this and I haven't got time for nails and I haven't got time for, you know, pedicures. Uh, speaking as one who's literally worn the t-shirt many times, I'm telling you, it's not worth it. Your health yeah. is not worth it. So you really have to struggle, structure your day, structure your business so that you have me time and you have celebration time. I mean, I've talked to people who say, you know, I've been staging for X amount of years and I actually, I've never paid myself. And I'm like, why? <laughs> Just why would you not pay yourself? I mean, you are the principal of the business. You should be getting paid on every job. You know, it's just yeah. like, I, re, I put the money back in. It's like, no, that's not good business planning. No. How could you no. work for years without getting any? How does it make you feel? Or as Dr. Phil always says, you know, how's it working for you? <laughs> how, how do you feel about not getting paid and working your ass off for seven years? You know, it's like it's no. not working. We all need to be getting paid and we all need to be making more money. Um, if Which anybody is another is, thing that we got from the report, there's no, they're not charging enough money. Yeah, they're not charging enough money. Um, and that report should be coming out soon to all of you. It's the Real Estate Staging Association State of the Industry report, um, where you'll learn more about the state of Ooh. the industry. In, <laughs> I <hit> in, the <laughs> in home staging. Um, as you guys are coming on, if you have any questions for Christine, please put them in the comments below. And we actually do have a question here from Elle Rivera. And she's asking, how are you promoting um, home staging during COVID? Thank you, ladies. Thank you for the question. So do you recommend any, do you recommend anything um, to your, to your um, uh, CSPs and stuff like Absolutely, but they're CSP secrets. <laughs> I'd have to kill you. No, I mean, but really, you still have to do your marketing the same as if it was not COVID, except that you'll be doing, instead of a face-to-face -face in an office, you might be doing a face-to-face -face like this on, on a Zoom call. You know, you have to still outreach. It takes seven to 20 times of a consistent marketing message for somebody to actually be aware that you're available. You know, and... Uh, if, I think that stages give up too soon. You know, they meet to, let's say they get introduced to a real estate agent and they get an opportunity to say, oh, you know, I'm a home stager, blah, 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 blah. And the person says, yeah, yeah, I'm busy right now, but give me a call. And then you make that phone call and you get voicemail. 
And it's a surprise to get voicemail. It's like you should anticipate voicemail and you should already know what you're going to say. And you should have recorded it and listened to it to yourself and refined it and to get them to call you back. So now you've called them and you've got a voicemail and they don't return your call. So now what are you going to do? And what most of them do will give up. Mm -hmm. right? There's no follow up. Don't know. And the majority of business happens after five or more times. So you still have to keep going, but it's knowing what to do after that, you know, what to do, what to say, what to take with you, how to, how to reach out. Um, you know, what method are you using for reaching out? You know, I mean, you've always been a proponent of video and I hate video. I hate it. I hate doing it and I hate them, you know? So when I get a, <laughs> an email with them in, I'm just like, no, I'm not listening to it, but I'm old, <laughs> you know? So you also have to know your demographic. Right. So you say, oh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Instagram. It's like, okay, the ba the baby boomers are not on Instagram. And they are the people who are selling houses. All right. So if yeah. you're trying to reach your young audience, great. Instagram's great. But, you know, um, I think it was some a number like, what was it I found? Something like, um, I want to say 89%. But 91 keeps popping into my head, but I just can't get it right. So let's say 89% of people who you are outreaching to they look you up on linkedin are you there are you actively building your business on linkedin a lot a lot of people do they just put it on instagram and say you know that's the bee's knees well it isn't it's not i actually this year i've been focusing more on youtube and actually pinterest because these are C, uh, seo um type platforms that when somebody goes into search because a lot of times those cold leads and those potential leads that you are looking for, they don't even really know what they're looking for. They're, they don't know they're looking for a home stager. They don't really know what solution a home stager has. So when you keep popping up in keywords that they're searching for, then that becomes um, obviously more valuable. I am popping in. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I am popping into the comments. Um, I rebranded my Facebook group recently. It's called now Visibility for Home Stagers and Real Estate Agents. And um, that's where we're going to be talking about some marketing tactics. It's all free. So feel free to um, pop in there, El Rivera, too, to get some more information as well. What were you going to say, Christine? I was going to say that's one of our problems in our industry um, is that we use the term home staging and home means decorating and we need to stop using it except for search engine optimizing. Um, you know, it's real estate staging and you want real estate agents to understand you're in the real estate business, not the decorating business. And if you're decorating, then you need to stop decorating and you need to focus on what staging is about. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope, um, those, those tips helped a little bit. Um, I would just say too that you need to just really focus on in on prospecting. Pick twenty five people or so that you want to reach out to, and just start reaching out to them. And like what Christine was saying, if they don't pick up the phone, then maybe try to DM them, try to friend them on a Facebook, um, sh show up where they are, and uh, and start trying to connect with them that way. But you gotta well, follow. Them. Yeah, you gotta follow them. <laughs> and, but you know, the real estate age. When I went to real estate school, they told me you gotta be prepared to put two hours a day into prospecting. Well, I was not new to sales. I've been in sales, you know, all, all my life pretty well. Um, but that's something that stagers don't do in their business is prospect for two hours a day. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I know you probably don't mind it because you were in sales, but I hate the phone. I, I No, I hate the phone. Are you kidding? I'm an <laughs> introvert. I hate talking to people. I just don't. But, you know, I just, I watched this, you know, Ryan's Sir Hunt, you know, for, from Million Dollar Real Estate Agent. Yeah. And, you know, he'll tell you how he got started in real estate. He came from Colorado to New York and didn't know anybody. Right. So I feel the same. I came to Canada. I knew nobody. And in order to know people, you got to talk to people. So he would talk to people on the street. And it's not like you're having some sort of weird conversation. It's like, excuse me, can you tell me where blah, blah, blah is? Or he would look at the areas that he wanted to work in and he joined the gyms in three or four places. And then he'd talk to people at the gym and, you know, he'd tell them he's in real estate and he followed up with everything.
But if you can start in a city like New York City without knowing a soul and build a, a multi, I don't know, a billion dollar business, um, and all of them do down there, but you know, you think you have to be connected. Well, you do have to be connected, but you don't have to start out connected. You can get connected. Yeah. And there's a great quote, and I wish I knew who did it, but you know, this always says to be an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to work like everybody isn't willing to work for about a year. Like you've put the effort in, you've got to fail, you've got to try things, you've got to keep going. You just have to keep the motivation going. And somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, you know, how come you're so, always so motivated? And I'm like, um, I can't say that I'm always motivated, but I never, ever have anticipated failure. You know, I, I'll tell you what happened to me. I don't know when it was. It was, I think I was like young 30s and I was a sales rep for an organization that had a very successful owner and he played golf with everybody he went to school with everybody and he knew everybody and no matter how many sales calls i made he would like oh i played golf with that guy oh i you know i know i went to school with that guy and so if i said oh i got a sale you know he's like oh i just played golf with him you know sort of shoot a hole in everything i'm like what the heck am i working for you know so one day i got invited into a, an investment club and i'm like are you sure you want me like I make $250 a week. Hello. You know, and they said, no, no, we want, we want you to come into it. And, and I'm was, you know, pretty savvy and I've got the suit going on, the big earrings and the square shoulders, you know, and I go into that and there was 11 guys and me and they're all businessmen, lawyers and wealthy and me, you know, and there was two guys and it's sort of like what crowdfunding would be today. Mm -hmm. Two guys did a presentation and they were looking for money, seed money. Want a thousand dollars from each person, and I'm like, a thousand dollars, and I think it's like gambling. You have to be, you have to be able to lose it, right? I had twelve hundred and fifty dollars in the bank, and that's a big chunk of it. So I I listen to what their presentation is, and I just you know just because I was one of the guys, I wanted to write the check for the thousand dollars, but I was scared to lose it, and. And really, I, I part of me probably wasn't scared, but I asked my mom, what would you do? And she's like, you can't afford to lose a thousand dollars. That's crazy. Um, so I declined. I declined. And the seed money was for trivial pursuit. Oh. Yeah. So I would be like mega wealthy. And every time they come up with a new package of, you know, show it's like, oh, you know, and so for me, when I got into staging, I said to my husband, this is another trivial pursuit moment for me. This is if I don't do this, you know, I will regret it because if I try it and I fail, I'm OK with that. Mm -hmm. But if I don't try it, then I'm not going to be able to be a happy person living with you. You know, <laughs> it's just not going to work. Um, so I always remember that. But so for me, you know, if I'm making a sales call, if I'm making a phone call, if I'm talking with a home seller. I always begin with the end in mind. You are gonna be a client of mine. You will be a client of mine. And it might not be today, it could be two years from now, but you will be a client of mine. And I just never entertained failure. Did I fail? Sure I did. Did I get the sales call every time? No, I didn't. Did I, but I looked at what went well, what could have gone better? How am I gonna make sure that happens? So that's how you get better at doing sales. And I think failing too, you know, obviously, but saying, you know, failure, you can't, you, you know, you can't be successful without failing so many times. And so I think like, you just have to accept that and do things scared of, from your story alone, you know, like just letting the fear kind of consume you. And if you feel like that's something that you should be doing in your gut, you probably should go out and try it. Um, I know another frequently asked question is that can you really be successful in this industry and make money so like what do you have to say to people who like aren't sure if this is really the right industry to get into if it's really profitable well what i would say to somebody first of all is what is your idea of success because everybody's is different so can you make money yes how much money how much do you want? Because it starts with how much do you want? It does not start with, let me see how much I can make. 
it starts with how much do you want to make? And you could say, oh, I want to make a million dollars. It's like, okay, well, now we just need to come up with a marketing plan to do that. But is that feasible in your first year? No, it's not. So let's figure out a number and come up with a plan for you to execute. It's just like losing weight. You know, it's like, oh, I want to lose weight. I want to lose weight. Okay. What are you willing to do to do the losing weight part? Mm -hmm. Will you walk five times a day, a week? Will you, you know, change the way you eat? Will you blah, blah, blah. And, and you can't just do it for a short time. You know, I was having a celebration yesterday. I lost a pound, two flipping weeks. It took me to lose a pound. And I'm like, okay, now it's like, I think, you know, one pound after two weeks. And my husband was like, well, you didn't put it on. Okay. That's a good thing. Okay. What did you do? Well, you know, and just keep going. And it's like, I just think it's the same with sales it's today. Or I think people in, I, I find in uh, inspiring um, people who've overcome all kinds of odds, but m more like Edison, you know, think about him trying to make a light bulb and sell the concept when everybody was using candles I'm going to make a glass bowl and there's going to be light coming out of it. And it's going to go through wires are going to come through the house and through the street. And everybody thought he was crazy. And, you know, every time he failed, his workers on his team would go, Oh, we failed. You failed. He goes, no, we just found a different way that it doesn't work. Keep going 2000 times before it worked. It's changing the mindset. Do you have a good, a mindset book for people to start reading if they, you know, feel stuck. I think home. Seth Godin, the purple cow is always good. But, you know, I think the thing in mind is to keep it's it's thinking about the thing always happens. Always happens that you really believe in. And it's your belief in the thing that makes it happen. So if you have you have an inner knowing, it's a part of your your being is to have an inner knowing. And if you have an inner knowing that really says you can be successful in this, then you just have to find the way, right? And that you can go on your own or you can come to the academy and we'll put you on the path. We're like a GPS for the staging business. Um, you wouldn't go on a trip, you know, across country without a map or knowing. It's just like, point my car, I'm headed for California. Will you get there? Sure, but wouldn't you rather- You weren't get driving there? with me across country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, well, I, I've done a lot of those drivings. Um, it's funny. My sister and I were driving to uh, Maryland and it's a five hour journey. And at, we left in the morning, like seven o'clock and at 11 o'clock at night, we're still on the way. My husband was like, why are you not there yet? <laughs> And my sister was using her GPS, which was old, and it kept telling us to come off and go through towns. And I'm like, this doesn't seem right. There's got to be a fast way to get to Maryland, you know. But Fine. anyway, it's another thing. But we still kept going, you know. And I think it was like 11, 1 o'clock in the morning when we got to the hotel, and we had to set up the room and I had to be teaching at 6.30, you know, like in the classroom. You know, you wouldn't think that we had, had not had any sleep. But it's just not letting adversity stop you. You know, there's always a reason not to do it. Just find mm -hmm. the reason to do it and stop having a pity party about everything that's going on. Because I don't know whether you know Paul Harvey. He was a great radio announcer and he his favorite thing was to tell you the rest of the story because you only know what you know about what you see today, whatever that thing is. And he would tell you the backstory of how it got to be like that. And he says it's important in times like these, so in pandemics, in bad economies, in good economies, he said it's important for you to remember there have always been times like these. Mm -hmm. And people have done business. Houses were sold in the Great Depression. Houses were sold in the last recession, you know. I bought my house, my own house as a single woman, 19.8% um, mortgage. People wow. still bought houses, you know, so at 3%, it's like everybody wants to buy a house, right? One yeah, of the things, like, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to say like, um, so the, the industry will 
supersede COVID and the times and this hot market where everyone's like, oh, they're not using stagers right now. And, you know, what, are, you know, I don't know what to do anymore. Um, you know, where is the, where's the industry heading in your eyes? You mentioned you're, you're thinking that it's going to have huge growth, but like, how, how is it, how is it going to grow? Because people ultimately are smart, smart real estate agents, smart builders, smart investors, people who are in our industry, um, realize that the best way to get property sold is to have it fully prepared for sale. This is not a decorating, nice to have service. It's about the photographs. And 100% of people are looking at photographs before they're making a decision to risk their life and come and see it in live. So you're staging for photographs. You have to stage for photographs first. That is the key thing. And that's the message that we have to get out. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's crucial. And who, if you look at people who own their properties and it's probably the biggest investment they'll ever have, why would they not want to get the highest return? on that investment. So you have real estate agents saying, oh, it's a hot market. We're selling properties as low inventory. They're selling over ask anyway. Okay. Well, one of my students told me just two weeks ago, uh, it's we're in lockdown. We're still in lockdown. And 600 people went through the house. 600 people. That's crazy. And that seller, it was an occupied stage, sold for a quarter of a million dollars over asking. Okay, wow. who wouldn't want that? <laughs> okay, staging for the photographs first. That's what we're doing. And it's what the message has to be that we get out there. It's just too many of us want to compromise, you know? And I think, I think there's a big mistake if we are not doing a thorough consultation. Too many of them just take that as sort of a surface walk through and tell them do this, this, and this. It's like, no, that's not helping them. You just want to get to move the furniture. That's only part of... Um, you know, we teach us at a three-step process, and I'm very um, rigid on that. I just think it's about the seller getting the most money possible in that sale of property. That's who we're working for. Yeah, and I think that's good. That's some good advice. So I hope everyone, home sellers, real estate agents, and even stagers took note of that, that we do need to be starting with those photos, especially now because of covid and people don't necessarily want to be interacting with strangers. Sure. That's right. So, I mean, it's like, why, why will, why will our industry grow is because it will become entrenched just like home inspection is a part of the parcel. Uh, staging is part of that parcel. It should not be a nice to do. Yeah. It should not be uh, a real estate agent gatekeeper saying no we don't need to do it on this house it should not be that so if we all work towards getting that message out then i see a tsunami of need and there won't be enough stagers and there definitely won't be enough furniture you know to work with <laughs> it's one of the issues today but they're just not expanding enough we can't see the future and you know i just i, I don't know in in 20 years ago if i look at you know, how am I? So it was forward of the trend. I look at things that happen in our industry or in the real estate industry and in the world and say, how is that going to affect the stager's life? So, you know, eco staging is a big thing. I might have made a mistake on. Um, I, on 2007, I thought it was going to be the next big thing. Mm -hmm. So it took more than five years for people to start paying attention to the planet and you know how it affects real estate how it affects real estate is it's not just the mortgage payment is can i afford the utilities once i move in so it's not save the tree but more about cleaner air you know efficiencies in in use of um, utilities in water you're in an area where xeriscaping actually started um so it's a big issue you know and the at the Millennials are the people who are, and the baby boomers, but they're both big stewards of the planet. And if you change light bulbs, 
throughout the house as part of your consult to energy efficient light bulbs, it saves 40% of the energy bill. That's a wow. big thing. And, and those bulbs now last seven years. So the people coming in don't have to buy light bulbs for seven years. And it seems like a simple little thing, but you know, it's, it's big in the long run. It adds up. You can save a lot of money if you just pay attention to those sort of things. So I think, you know, our industry is going to grow because uh, the way of the future, the way of this next two, three years is wellness. That is the key element. So having clean air within your house. And if you're selling that house, how can you protect the people who are coming through? And what is the well-being message that's been put through the staging that you do? Right. It's changing those abstract art pieces to scenes of nature that calm people down. Um, mm -hmm. There's just there's so many ways that you can help with this message of um, in a way, it's a renaissance in the way that uh, the biophilic design that came out about, well, under 10 years ago, but it's became really big um, about three years ago. And it's like the watchword now in the design industry is the biophilic. And that meant no VOCs on the paint, but it's also integrating nature. And as we move back into our office buildings, you're gonna have more live plants because they clean the air and we're gonna be better stewards of it as long as we don't forget the message, right? What was the yeah. learning, you know? I was reading something today, it was pretty depressing. It's like, they think that we'll be wearing masks for 10 years. I'm like, now I do have one that's got a window here that you can see my, <laughs> and you the lips that doesn't come off, you know? <laughs> but I just like, can you imagine 10 more years? Oh no, I couldn't. No. So, we'll be, somebody will be watching this in 10 years and be like. <laughs> they won't be watching me in 10 years. I can tell you. <laughs> Well, I know as the future of the home staging industry changes, uh, you will be at the forefront of it, helping to educate others about ways that they can pivot and move forward in our changing world. I want uh, to thank you for joining me so much today, Christine. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to say? I'm sorry. Any final thoughts? No, but I'm, I have on my wall here, I have a poster. It says, if you're not the lead dog, the scenery never changes. And so that's something to keep in your mind, you know, as you're moving in. It's like, don't just be one of the cogs in the wheel. You want to be the best stager in your area. That's what your goal is, you know, when you're working for the seller to be able to attract that buyer. It's really important that you get your message out there. Sorry, for, I cut you off again. I'm going to no, for people to learn more about, um, you know, the academy and you, where should they go? They should go to stagingtraining.com mm -hmm. and click on the calendar and you'll see all the different um, programs that we teach and uh, so forth. That would be yes. great. Thanks very much for the blog. Appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys so much for joining us today, checking out the replay. Make sure if you have any questions about becoming a home stager or about the home staging industry, uh, please share them in the comments below in either uh, myself or I'll redirect the question to Christine uh, so you can get the so you can get the proper answer. Thank you so much, Christine. Pleasure is mine. <laughs> have a good day. Bye.